This video is a brief introduction to organic chemistry. So what we're going to cover uh, in this video, that's all you need to know for this week, is um, some, some general introductory concepts. Uh, we're going to go over hybridization that you already covered in Gen Chem 1, but it's really critical. So we're going quickly over that. We're just uh, learning to identify alkanes, um, and so learning some name. And then we're going to learn how to write formulas. So structural formulas versus skeletal formulas. So first of all, I would like you to watch a movie that kind of uh, talked to you about um, organic chemistry, especially it addressed the issue of this class being very scary. And I know for those of you who have to take it, um, you're probably quite worried, especially with the whole online uh, option that could start right away in fall. So this is is trying to uh, take away a little bit of drama and trying to explain that it's actually a cool branch of chemistry. So watch the movie and then come back here. So what is organic chemistry? Organic chemistry is a branch of chemistry that focuses on um, compounds that contain carbons, typically containing carbon-carbon uh, bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds. But there, are, there may be other elements that are kind of often found in um, uh, organic, organic compounds. So although carbon and hydrogen are sort of the, the main character, but they are also the less interesting because carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds are pretty stable. So they are not uh, that reactive, so they are not that interesting when you're trying to build new molecules. And so the other, other elements tend to be nitrogen and oxygen, mainly, and halogen, uh, like chlorine or fluorine. Um, there are compounds that contain carbon, like carbonic acid, carbonates, um, you know, carbon dioxide, um, carbon monoxide. Those are not considered organic compounds. So let's see some example of organic compounds and how those formulas uh, look like. So I, I pick compounds that are, you know, part of your everyday life. Um, and so, for, for example, this compound is caffeine. So you already see that um, it's quite different from what you've been seeing so far. The, the, the molecules are bigger and more complicated, and there are some weird things going on because um, it's not clear what those... Um, let me get the pointer. What those lines means, right? Uh, what, what's there? Are there atoms there? So we will, we will learn how to uh, kind of decipher this, this formula. So you see here, for example, you have um, a bunch of carbon, more than you would suspect, because of course there is a carbon here, a carbon here, and a carbon here. But actually each of these corner, wherever two lines are meeting at an angle, um, this is going to be a carbon atom, and then all, uh, there, there may be hydrogen there, but they don't, they don't get to be written because they are kind of boring. So it's a bit like spectator ions. You remember we were getting rid of those, and the same is for hydrogen atoms in organic molecules. We don't write them unless they are particularly um, relevant, and so it's kind of understood that because carbon makes four bonds, like whenever you see that there are already four bonds, like this. Um, intersection here. Let me get a um, um, highlighter. Right. So this intersection here is the intersection of four lines. That means four bonds. So that carbon is already uh, done because it can only make four carbons. Um, but uh, for example, let's say uh, here, right? Then you see that there is um, there are only three lines intersecting, so there is one of the four bonds of uh, carbon is not kind of drawn. So the, 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 what is understood is that there is an hydrogen here. So there is a, the fourth bond is with hydrogen. It just we just don't write it because the molecule looks already complicated as it is. If we would have to write all the hydrogens, it would get really overwhelming. So we kind of skip those. So basically, you need to be able to count up to four, count the lines, and um, every every whatever is missing to get to four is an hydrogen. And it seems simple, but sometimes you you know you can overlook things that that happens pretty uh, common often. So you can either you know draw uh, a wrong formula because there are only three bonds. With, uh, with carbon, or maybe you may be a little too zealous, uh, zealous and, and put five bonds, in which case that's not possible. Carbon can only have four. So um, the nickname for formulas where 
carbon is being erroneously assigned five bonds is Texas carbon because you know everything is bigger in Texas. So this, for example, is penicillin. So again, you see that you have um, you have some extra um, atom respect. So all the atoms that are not carbon are always written because those are those are interesting sides of the molecule. Those are point of the molecules where something can happen, reactions, right? So you have nitrogen, you have oxygen, and you have sulfur, and that's a little more frequent than nitrogen and oxygen, but it could happen. And here you have another oxygen and an OH. So this area of the molecule where we um, where we have a cl um, interesting atoms, let's say, those are called functional groups. So we will learn that this functional group is, for example, a carboxylic acid. Now, in this unit, in this specific video, I will not cover functional groups. That's going to be next week. So don't worry about it. Right. We're just kind of introducing the general sense of organic chemistry. This is another functional group. Um, this is another functional group. Right. And so forth. Um, what is R? R is not an element that you can find in the periodic table, right? So what does it mean? R is um, what we write when we don't want to take a commitment on a specific um, group of atoms connected there. We just, we just what we're trying to say is there's something there and it can be different depending on circumstances. So it's called a radical. That's why the R letter. And it just means there's going to be some more, something more there. And it's like, you know, when you're trying to customize your car and you can take, you can add a certain color or you can add a certain type of seats. So that's the optional part, right? So, um, so that, that heart is something that can be different. Depending. So you can have many different molecules, penicillin uh, by changing R. And so you can play around with trying to make, for example, Penicillin uh, staying longer in your body because the main issue, penicillin was like the first antibiotic and it was really revolutionary. It was introduced uh, during uh, about um, around World War II or shortly after. And in the beginning, the main problem they had was that it was just uh, staying in the body for a very, very short time and it was eliminated uh, mostly through the kidneys. And so, as, as gross as it may sound, they were actually um, collecting the urine of the patients and, and recovering uh, penicillin from it, because at the beginning it was hard to produce it, so it was very expensive. And um, I had a grandmother um, who um, got typhoid fevers, and her husband had to... Um, go on the black market to find some penicillin around World War II. So it was really something, um, you know, a kind of uh, revolutionary and, and expensive. So they would go through the urine of the patient trying to recover it. And then eventually the production became, um, more, let's say, uh, such that, you know, it, it was cheaper. But by modifying this R group, you can make it uh, stay longer or and then, you know, some um, bacteria would develop resistance. They would be uh, they would not be killed anymore by penicillin. So you can change R so that maybe you make something that's active on a different type of bacteria or still active on bacteria that became resist resistant to the basic penicillin. So those R are actually quite important. Um, so we have seen a medication, we've seen um, uh, something that we use recreationally, let's say caffeine, right? So if we would have to put um, one of the reasons we are so much, we live so much longer, it's, um, you know, it's sure it's, it's medicine, but it's mostly antibiotic and we are kind of uh, spoiling them, using them in the wrong way. Um, and this is uh, cholesterol, right? So this is a molecule that you have... Um, heard for sure that it is very important we test how much we have in our bloodstream because if we have too much it would start um it would let's say um trigger the deposit of plaques in the arteries and you know predispose you to um cardiocirculatory diseases so you see that in the molecule of cholesterol you have this uh, circle um cyclic structure right so let's see if I can do that. Uh, you see you have these hexagonal shapes. It looks a bit like a beehive, right? Here we, we saw one that was square. Um, here we saw also the hexagons and, and a pentagon. 
and uh, again here we can see another pentagon so you see that in this case you have mostly carbon and hydrogen um, the only other atom is uh, this oxygen here so it's a, a pretty uh, basic molecule let's say um, you see something else interesting there are some bonds that are drawn uh, instead of with just a simple line they are um, drawn with like this dotted line uh, dashes or these wedges here like right? so that's is it's a um, they are trying to give a sense of perspective so the edges mean that those um, this, so this molecule is mostly kind of flat so it would be lying on the on the plane of the of the slide but something uh, sticking out toward the observer and some other atoms are going inside back in the back let's say of, of your screen almost so <clears throat> when a bond is is drawn as a wedge it means it's coming out so it's a sort of some sort of angle um towards the observer while when they are drawn as uh, with dashes uh, then it's going behind the plane um, where the molecule is drawn and those hydrogen are uh, written oddly because I just told you that hydrogen are too boring and we don't put them there but that's because um, uh, those atoms uh, in those those particular um, intersection <clears throat> they are bonded to four different things and this makes the those atom uh, chiral um, that's kind of a complication in organic chemistry that I will not cover other than with a very very basic introduction uh, next week uh, but it's, it's going to be uh, you know it's, it's, it's one of the hardest concepts uh, to figure out um, so the, this is the periodic table um, from the perspective of an organic chemist because as, as I said there are way less elements right so <clears throat> And this is kind of a joke obviously but um, basically you know it, it all revolves around carbon and there are some very predictable patterns so carbon always makes four bonds it's one of the things in life that you can trust right we don't know what's going to happen in fall if we're going to be online if we're going to be in person I showed up in person because I missed the contact with the students um, I'm, I'm sure you, are, you have not enjoyed the online classes um, that much either so let's hope that, that in fall we will be able to <clears throat> go back to normality but you know we have to do what we have to do so carbon can only uh, will always form four bonds um, and <clears throat> hydrogen always one bond so hydrogen is always kind of a dead end in the map of an organic molecule it's like a dead end street um, uh, oxygen can always make two bonds and typically would have also um two unshared pairs nitrogen is one unshared pairs and makes three bonds and so those and, and halogen especially fluorine um is just uh, behaving like hydrogen with the difference that it has three unshared pairs okay so this is kind of recurrent theme in in molecules hybridization why do we have to introduce this concept um if you remember um the lewis structure uh, right so carbon would look something like that so there would be four dots representing the four electrons that uh, carbon has and they are available to make bonds because they are not already paired up however if we look at the electron configuration that Lewis was totally unaware of um, Lewis was basing his, his structure on empirical findings, you know, so carbon makes four bonds, therefore there are four dots, basically. But in the electron configuration, I see only two electrons that are not shared and, and used already for bonds or unshared pairs. So I would think that only these two would be able to make a bond, therefore the formula of carbon uh, of methane should be CH2. And that's not the case, so I need to explain that the other problem that i have is the shape i know that um that's i mean it's experimentally uh, verifiable that the shape of car of uh, ch4 is um, a tetrahedron with angle of 109.5 and they're all identical and while well, here i have two p uh, the electrons that 
are available to make a bond are in um, p orbitals. They and you remember they have the peanut shape, but they also um, are in 90 degrees from each other. So <clears throat> like the axis x, y, and z. So it doesn't really does kind of clash with the actual uh, angle that I can measure. So the first thing that I could do, I could imagine to take this, elect this um, electron here, take it away from here, and promote it up here. This requires energy, not a lot, because the 2s and the 2p orbitals are kind of close to each, relatively close to each other. At room temperature, you may, you may have enough energy, and uh, you kind of get a debit of energy, but then when you form bonds, those are um, that's an exothermic process, so you get back the energy, and, and even more than, than the one you use. So it's still, let's say, feasible, right? Uh, so by having four uh, unpaired electrons, um, I can explain why there are four bonds, but I still don't understand why the bonds are identical because it looks like three should be, you know, having certain characteristic that th these three should be identical to each other, but this should be different. Um, and also, I, I still have the issue of the 90 degrees angle that is not what's happening in the molecule. So I also need to think that be, be, beside the fact that the electron needs to be promoted, there also has to be a, a sort of a mixing of those orbitals. Like, it's like imagine like you put them in a, in a mixer, and what you pull out are four identical orbitals with an energy that's kind of halfway in between. It's more than the 2s, but it's less than the 2p. So we give them a special name, um, sp3. The name comes from the two orbital types that we have been using. And then we also want to tell how many orbitals of each type we have been using. So we've been using 1s, so we don't even bother writing the 1 as an exponent, the same way you wouldn't write it in algebra, let's say. But we do write the 3 um, here by the, um, by the p, because we want to uh, say explicitly that we have been used all three p orbitals. So the rules are that in order to get a hybrid orbital, you need to mix at least two orbitals. It's like if you want to make a new color with your acrylic paint, you need to mix at least two colors. If you mix green and green, you don't get anything new. But if you mix green uh, and uh, blue, you would get turquoise, right? So you get also, also you get as many orbitals as you have mixed. So in this case, we have mixed one, two, three, four orbitals. We get four hybrid orbitals. The characteristic of the orbitals are so, somehow intermediate, so you see here you're mixing something that has a peanut shape with something that's spherical, you get sort of an asymmetric peanut. The more, with the fact that there are more P than S makes the result more similar to the uh, item that I had, you know, in the larger quantity. It's like if you mix a lot of yellow with a little amount of blue, the green that you get is more yellowish. But if you add a lot of blue to a little bit of yellow, you get a green that is more bluish, right? So that's kind of a similar concept. Uh, that, this, this way I can understand why I can form four bonds and they are identical. So because the molecule of methane is as a 3D shape, is a tetrahedron, and we are constrained by the fact that we are drawing on a flat surface, we need to get some, um, to use some um, sort of artistic um, tricks and use some perspective, right? So this is rendered by uh, the type of line you use to represent the bond. If you just use a basic uh, straight line, it means that that bond is on the same plane as the paper or the screen. If you use a dotted or a dashed line, it's going to come out. So in this case, these two bonds, one and two, are on the same plane, so hydrogen, carbon, and this hydrogen are on the same plane as the piece of paper. This one, because it's dotted, is going behind the page, while this wedge tells you that this hydrogen is coming out of the page. So let's have a look at these two molecules, uh, methane and ethane. So methane is a molecule that we see multiple times, and we know that even if we draw it like that, because maybe we're in an area and we just don't um, are not particularly worried about the shape, but the actual shape is not like a, a diamond, like if, and the, 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 the um, bonds are not in 90 degrees, but it's actually a tetrahedron. 
What about ethane? Right? What would be the shape of ethane? So first of all, we notice that there is um, a similarity in the name. Uh, they, they, they have the same ending, and that's the same ending as the family uh, they belong to, alkane. So the name is already giving you information about somehow the structure, as we will learn in the next slides. But what about the shape? So it's a bit like those toys that children play with, you know, where they can connect different shapes, making a long chain. So each carbon is going to have four electron region around it. Therefore, is a tetrahedron, and then you connect those tetrahedron in a long chain of tetrahedron, or maybe some, every now and then there can be a trigonal planar or, or something else. So in this case, we have two tetrahedron connected. So let's see the, this family alkanes. So this is a list of the first ten alkanes, and you may notice a pattern, right? So. Um, for each carbon, there are, well, let, let's set aside methane, the first one. So we know that each carbon uh, has to make four bonds, right? So for example, in ethane, um, C2H6, uh, because there is already a bond between the two carbons to link them together, each carbon has only three bonds left. That's why there are six hydrogen. So we can think um, about... Um, so having a chain like this, the number of hydrogen that I can connect, considering that um, each carbon can only make four bonds, are two per each carbon, like as, like that. And then I'm, you know, I'm going to write the hydrogen just because I don't want you to get confused. And then, no matter how long or short the chain is, I will have to add an hydrogen here and an hydrogen here. So the number of hydrogen for structure like that is always going to be twice the number of carbons plus two for the two extremities, right? And you see that patterns reflects very easily. Um, so what about the names um for, so that's that's the formula that uh, allows you to calculate so even if i tell you let's say uh, write me the formula of an alkane that has 20 atoms of carbon you don't have do not have to actually draw the whole chain that would take quite a lot of time you just think well if it has 20 atoms of carbon uh, then the number of hydrogen is going to be 20 plus 20 40 plus 2 42 so how is are those name picked? The last five, well, the last six actually, um, they have predictable name that comes from the same Greek prefixes you've been using in geometry and you've been using the nomenclature of inorganic compounds, so penta for five, hexa for six, hepta for seven, and so forth. The first four, because they were molecules that were known to human kind, you know, for, for a long time, they have historical names. So methane, the name comes from um, alcohol um, because uh, it's the type of alcohol that can be, methanol is a type of alcohol that can be obtained by uh, the distillation of wood. Um, it's also present in um, product of the fermentation, let's say, of grapes. So, for example, so if you take a bottle of wine, the main alcohol is methan um, ethanol, but there is also a small amount of methanol. But unfortunately, methanol is very toxic. And so I will tell you that story when we will talk about alcohol. Ethane comes from the same root that you use for the word ether, ethereal. Um, propane is, comes from the prefix pro, that means first, like think about prototype. That's because as you increase the number of carbon, these, um, they tend to have um, the acid that derives from this structure tend to have a oily consistency. Uh, texture, let's say, uh, to detach. And so propane is the first one that shows that behavior, and therefore that's the, the, where the pro comes. Butte comes from uh, butter, so B-U-T like in butter, because when butter gets rancid, uh, the, the, there is a, the compound that is responsible for the characteristic smell is butanoic uh, acid. So 
so that that's are the name basically so yes you are supposed to know these names uh, but the, the the ending is always the same right methane you know already ethan you know because you know ethanol um and then the other is just the prefixes that you're already familiar with um okay so we can i feel like i was going to tell you something else but it just doesn't come to me right now oh yes so what does alkane mean so what do you uh, what a compound needs to have to belong to this family okay first of all only carbon and hydrogen nothing else but then there are many families of uh, compounds with carbon and hydrogen so alkanes also they have no double bonds they have no triple bonds and um, they also have no structure closed in a circle, so they have no cycles. So let's have a look at this molecule. Um, we see that there are three atoms of carbon, so we know that the root for the name of this molecule is going to be PRO, uh, PRO. And then to determine the ending, we need to figure out um, what, which family it belongs to, basically. Right? So the formula is C3H8, so it does fit in that um, criteria of C, uh, N, H, 2, N plus 2. Um, so it's an alkane, and so we're going to call it propane, propane. Now let's have a look at this one, though. It's very similar because there are still there is still a backbone of three atoms of carbon. It doesn't really matter if I draw it, you know, with an angle. like here or where you know can kind of try because there are three groups here like one two three so when there are three electron regions the shape is trigonal planar so here they are trying to represent it with a realistic angle of 120 same here well here there are these angle of 90 degrees that really have no physical meaning but it doesn't matter i can you know write them straight in a line or i can write them and, and take a corner it's those are arbitrary thing they don't they don't mean anything in terms of identifying the, the product. So in this case, what's important is that the hydrogen are only six, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's because there is a double bond, so and carbon can only make four. So this doesn't fit anymore in that um, formula, Cn, because this is Cn uh, H2n period. So what it means is that the presence of a double bond uh, reduces the number of hydrogen that are in the formula even more so if there would be a triple bond even more so if one molecule has two double bonds in two different places look at what I, so the, we're going we need a different name for this one because um it's still a chain of three but it is it belongs to a different family it belongs to the family where there are double bonds so we changed the uh, ending in propene and so and so this is going to be the family of the alkene this is another variation of this molecule that would share the very same molecular formula. So this shows you that the molecular formula doesn't really tell you much because it doesn't tell you how atoms are connected. And in organic chemistry, this makes the whole difference. It be becomes a dramatic difference. So in this case, the three atoms of carbon are connected in a cyclic structure. So even if I do not have any double bond, but I still have uh, less hydrogen than the propane. So I need a new name for this one too. We are going to call it cyclopropane. We still keep the A in A and E because there are no double bonds, so it doesn't belong to this family. But we add cyclo so that the person who sees the name knows that they has this special feature of the atom of carbon connected in a circle. So because they have the same formula, these are called isomers. So we can identify uh, two formulas now, CnHn plus 2. 2n plus 2 that that below um, identify uh, alkane cn h2n it's not really telling you that much other than there is either one double bond or a cyclic structure the more you add of these features the less hydrogen there will be in the formula now for this unit uh, just focus on alkane don't worry about the other two we will talk about that next week. 
Okay, so let's just have a look, have a look at the difference between the two. So let's see an alkene and an alkene. So in this case, no double bonds. In this case, we have a double bond. So again, this formula, this way of writing the structural formula is somehow reminiscent of the actual shape because it's actually planar and it's trigonal planar. This is totally um, not descriptive because it looks like it's flat with 90 degrees or, um, angles, but it's actually um, two tetrahedron connected to each other. Okay, well, this is planar. So this is connected. So we've seen that in methane, we have an sp3 hybridization where um, where <clears throat> four orbitals, all four orbitals are interested in the hybridization. So we have the promotion of one electrons from this orbital up here, and then all four orbitals are uh, mixed together to form the four hybrids, and these hybrids are called sp3. What happens um, when we have a double bond? When we have a double bond, we have an sp2 hybridization. So let's consider only one carbon at a time. So let's focus on the one on the left. The one on the right is doing exactly the same. So each atom of carbons are going again to promote one electron up to the empty orbital. However, only two of the p orbitals and the 2s are used for the hybridization. So I mix three, I get three. I'm calling those sp2 because there are only two uh, p orbitals used. Again, the sum of the one that I've written uh, is kind of uh, understood for, uh, as an exponent of s plus the two gives me three. That's the total number of electrons. Um, that is the number of uh, orbitals that I have obtained. And the 1p is set aside. So what happens is that you end up with a molecule in which the three hybrid orbitals are trying to stay as far away from each other as possible. So they are on a plane that would correspond to the plane of your desk. Uh, that, uh, and they have 120 degrees angle. So it's a a trigonal planar shape. And then the p orbitals, the one in blue that's been set aside, is still at a, a 90 degrees angle, so it's vertical with respect to the plane of the trigonal planar geometry. So how do they connect to form the... So once you have the two atoms that have a sp2 hybridization, how do they come together to form the bond? Okay, so the th this, um, in this picture in purple, um, so one, two, and three are the three hybrid orbitals um, of the first carbon. And then one, two, and three are the three sp2 orbitals of the other carbon. And so they can overlap head to head, the first one, to form a, um, a covalent bond that is a sigma bond that <clears throat> is formed by, let's say, um, merging the two orbitals head to head. So that's the most efficient way to form a bond. It's like when you're trying to glue something, the more efficient place to put the, the glue is in be, uh, right at the point where you are trying to join the, the two objects. So this sigma <coughs> bond is formed by the overlapping of two hybrid sp2 orbitals. Then the other two sp2 orbitals are used to make uh, bonds with the hydrogen. The hydrogen doesn't have any hybridization because the hydrogen has only one orbital s and as such it stays. So this is still a sigma bond. Um, the first bond that you form is always a sigma bond, but it is coming out of the uh, overlapping of a non-hybrid orbital s to a uh, um, hybrid sp2 orbital. So when you're forming a sigma orbital, you can overlap any type of orbitals. Uh, they don't have to be identical. So like for in this case, the hydrogen is contributing with an s, the carbon is contributing with an sp2. And the hybrid can be sp2, can be sp3, can be sp. Um, if you are um, bonding two hydrogen together, then it's going to be a sigma bond out of the overlapping of two s non-hybrid orbital. So to make a sigma bond, you can use everything, right? Here, what's not represented here, it's the uh, unused p orbital, the one that's not hybridized, because it would come out, it would be perpendicular. So if this structure is in the plane of the page, 
the p unused the unused uh, p orbital will be coming towards you and behind the screen right so if we flip it a bit and try to represent with a little bit of perspective so we can also see the uh, the p orbitals like this one and those can only overlap sideways on top and beyond and, and below so that's going to be a pi bond so a pi bond has two halves one on top and one uh, at the top at the bottom so if we really want to try to give some perspective we can put all everything that's on this plane here this grayish plane is going to be represented with lines using the wedges and the dotted line and we can see the, the pi bond. So the pi bond can only be formed by overlapping non-hybrid p orbitals because only those, they have the right uh, geometry to, to be able to overlap. So what if we want to make a triple bond? Um, again, let's consider one atom, at, one atom of carbon at a time for simplicity. So if we want to form a triple bond, what we need to do is hybridize only two orbitals one uh, the s and one of the three p's and set the other two p's aside so the result of the hybridization would be two hybrid orbitals we're going to call them sp because they come with a contribution of only one s and one p if you have two of them with them we can make sigma bonds the first sigma bond is going to be the one between carbon and hydrogen the other sigma bond is going to be the one between carbon and the other carbon but to make the second bond and the triple bond, we need to use the non-hybridized orbital because they have the right geometrical orientation. So once we get the two atoms to connect, okay, they would form, use, so this uh, in red would be one of the two hybrid and the other one in red is the other hybrid. So with one hybrid, we form the bond with hydrogen on this side. With the other hybrid, we form the uh, bond with hydrogen on the other side. And then we overlap head to head these two, and we get this connection in between. So we get a sigma bond between the two carbons. But then to form the pi bonds, we need to overlap these two that are vertical. So one orbital here, one orbital here, overlapping on top and at the bottom. But then, and then we have these other that are kind of entering into the plane. They are sort of on an horizontal plane, like the plane of your desk. This would have to overlap in front and in the back. And this would make the two pi bonds. Okay, so let's try to wrap up everything. So uh, a single bond is made of just a sigma bond. If you have a double bond, it's going to be... Um, is going to be made of one sigma plus one pi. A triple bond is made of one sigma and two pi's. So the first one that you need is always a sigma. Then on top of that, you can build a second bond that's going to be a pi, or a second and a third bond, and those are going to be both pi. Uh, the hybridization, when you have a single bond, when you have all single bonds, is going to be sp3, that means a tetrahedral geometry. With the double bond, you are going to have a um, trigonal partner geometry with the sp2 and with the triple bond is going to be linear and the hybridization is going to be sp now i also put here the energy bond carbon carbon energy bond we are going over that just remember they're always positive because breaking bonds is always um, endothermic so in this table you see an example right of an alkane an alkene and an alkyne uh, you don't have to remember these names, just only the name alkyne. But you need to remember what type of hybridization is associated with each uh, type of bond, right? So which orbitals uh, do you use for an sp3 hybridization? You need 1s and 3ps. For an sp2 hybridization is 1s and 2ps. And for an sp hybridization, just 1s and a p. So the number of hybrid, hybrid, uh, hybrid orbitals is going to be 4 for sp3, 3 for sp2, and 2 for sp. And the geometry is going to be tetrahedral for sp3, trigonal planar for sp2, and linear for sp. And yes, you should remember the angles. So a single bond is going to be stronger because the overlapping is head to head while a pi bond is going to be weaker because you are relying on a lateral overlapping. 
When you form a sigma bond, you can use pretty much any type of orbitals. But to form a pi bond, you need to use an hybrid p orbitals. Now, there seems to be a contradiction between what I'm telling you here, that the sigma is stronger than the pi, and these values of energy, right? So that's because name, different names mean different things. So in, first of all, here we're comparing sigma and pi. Here we're comparing single and double and triple. So when you have a double bond, you have two bonds. You have a sigma and a pi, right? So as having two bonds, you have more, it's like putting more glue. So you have a stronger overall connection that requires more energy to be broken to be broken this energy is the energy that it takes to separate completely completely the two atoms so if there is a sigma if there is a double bond that is a sigma and a pi 614 kilojoules is how much energy it takes to break the sigma and break the pi that of course is just is going to be more than just to break one sigma and breaking one sigma and two pi is going to take even more energy but if I'm comparing the two types, the sigma is more is stronger because it implies head-to-head um, uh, -head, um, overlapping with maximum density in between the two atoms, while with the pi, the overlapping is lateral above and below the axis that connects the two nuclei, right? Okay, so classification of hydrocarbons. The only one we have talked about today are the alkanes. Then we have kind of seen that there, if there is a double bond, we change the name into alkenes. And if we have a triple bond, we change it into alkyne. But these two last names are not required for this test. Okay. Um, the, all three of them are called aliphatic or acyclic. That means that the chain is open, that there is no cyclic structure. Because another option is that you can have cyclic um, shapes, and we have seen some of those. Like we have seen um, cyclopropane, for example, that's as a triangular shape, and then there are two hydrogen connected to each carbon. Um, you can have a, a circular structure, and you can have a double bond also inside the. the uh, cyclic structure, so things can become more and more complicated. And then finally, you have this type of compound. So you might have seen this in Jenkins one uh, that is drawn like that. It's called benzene, and we will not really talk much about that at all. So for the time being, the only thing that you really need to worry is our alkanes and naming those. Just meaning, um, just knowing the the general name. So how do we write organic molecules? <clears throat> As we see in the molecular formula, although very quick to write, is not that informative because there may be multiple isomers, multiple molecules with the same formula and just different connectivity, right? But those are the ones that we, we've been using when we're writing chemical equation. Now, the structural formula that I've been using uh, quite a lot is the one that shows you all the bonds. So it actually tells you who's connected to what. But it's, it's kind of um, time consuming to write it. And mo many molecules, um, organic molecules, they don't have just four atoms. They have like 10, 20. So it gets really frustrating to have to write all those hydrogen. Um, so we kind of use a sort of a short hand notation where we clump together. So you see that, for example, these are the same, the different way. <clears throat> these three molecules, these three, let me get the pointer. These three um, formulae are exactly the same thing. There is no difference. And they correspond to this one, too. So what happens is that you take <coughs> a cluster. You sort of divide the molecule in section, right? One, two, three, four. And so you kind of focus on the connectivity between carbons and you cluster together all the hydrogen that are connected to that carbon. That's kind of deceiving in a way because, um, you know, if you, if you write this line between the carbon and the hydrogen, you may think that there is a bond hydrogen carbon here, but that's not the case. So all the hydrogen before the line are connected directly to this carbon. And the bond is carbon-carbon bond. 
Oh, so the fact that I, you know, I can draw them straight in a line, or I can decide to make a band here, or I can decide to make a band and then another band, that, that doesn't mean that it's a different thing. It's just the same thing. It's like, think about that um, example of the uh, child toy. You know, you can bend it, but the, if the sequence is the same, it's still the same structure. So a really convenient way to write this formula is what is called a uh, skeletal formula. And those are very much reduced to, to the basics. So they're sort of a really heavy short ending. And this seems kind of um, difficult at the beginning, but once you get used to them, they save you a lot of time, right? So in skeletal form, so these two are representation of the same. Uh, uh, these two formulas represent the same one. So what's happening in the skeletal formula? The carbon <coughs> connection, the connection between two carbon is a line. Um, as you can see, there are every intersection corresponds to an atom of carbon. So you have one, two, and then the one that you may get confused are the terminal ones, because there is no angle, but is actually uh, a carbon there. It's just it's just at the end of the line. So you see that there are four carbons total. Uh, all the hydrogen <coughs> that are connected to carbons are not written. So how do you know they are there? You need to count, right? So let's take a call. You see this carbon, um, this carbon here is, is making only two connections. I know that each carbon should have four connections, so I need to add other two, and those are going to be atoms of hydrogen. Here I would have three. Here I would have only one, and here I would have three. So that gives me a total of three, and three is six, plus two, eight, nine, and ten, with the one that's connected to the oxygen. And in fact, I see that there is a correspondence between the two. Um, so this. group here is written so in extensor, so you don't do any abbreviation, any simplification, because it's important, because the functional group is going to determine the, pro the properties, the chemical behavior, the reactivity. Nothing really interesting is going to happen in this portion of the molecule, because carbon-hydrogen bonds are pretty stable and don't react easily. So that, that's the reason why we make a difference between Okay, so this would be the skeletal uh, representation of those uh, uh, first 10 hydrocarbons that uh, we have seen uh, at the beginning. So, yes, you are supposed to remember that those, just those names, and you need to be able to draw the skeletal formula, and it's just a matter of doing a little bit of practicing. So let's see some examples of skeletal formulas. Like The first one is propane. Um, so it's uh, I can tell that is a, a alkane because the number of hydrogen is eight. They correspond to three uh, times two plus two. So I know that there are no double bonds and no cyclic structure. The semi-structural formula uh, show me that you know there is a direct connectivity, sort of a linear trend. The structural formula show me every single bond, but that's kind of boring because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take forever to, to draw all those hydrogen. So the skeletal formula is more like an accent sign. So let's see uh, this one. This uh, is ethanol. So it's the alcohol that's obtained by fermentation of sugar. Uh, so the semi-structural formula highlights the uh, functional group, that is this one. Um, and also here in the skeletal formula, you can see that everything is simplified, but not that, because that's a really an important feature of the molecule. With the same molecular formula, I could have um, ether, ethyl ether, that in the same, you know, I cannot, I, if, if I compare these two, it seems to me exactly the same identical thing. In order to uh, understand the difference between these two components, I need to see how they are, uh, what the connectivity is. So I need to at least 
compare the semi-structural formula, where I would see that in one case the oxygen is at the end, in the other case the oxygen is in between two carbon, right? So this, for sure, this formula is kind of really showing you all the connectivity. But like in the skeletal, I would still have all the information that are relevant. It looks like a little like a bat or like an eagle you know, flying, right? Um, in this case, this is acetic acid, so we have another functional group. Again, you don't have to worry about functional group now, if you don't remember the names. We will talk about that next week. So, this formula doesn't really tell me much. Uh, I wouldn't even understand that it's an acid, right, because all the hydrogen are clumped together. But actually, the hydrogen that's connected to the oxygen here, that's the one that's acidic. Those three hydrogen are not acidic at all. So uh, acetic acid is a monoprotic acid, right? And I can see that also in the skeletal formula. So again, uh, you also can see here how you represent the double bond. Um, more often than so, they will not put explicitly the dots for their shared pairs. And so you can count the atom of carbon and see that there are two, one, one and two and then finally <clears throat> there is an amino acid glycine in this case we have two functional group that's why it's called amino acid one is the amine group amine, amine group and the other one is the carboxylic acid group that's identical to this one right uh, and the carbon is sitting in the middle so this would be the skeletal representation with your atom of carbon here, and this is the carbon of the functional group. So last thing, how do we represent in skeletal formula uh, triple bonds and double bonds? So let's see this example. This corresponds to a chain of um, uh, six atom of carbon with a triple bond in the middle. So the, uh, this one is the um, this one is the uh, semi-structural formula, and this one is the structural formula, right? So we can see that there is sort of a straight line of carbons, and ju just in the middle of the triple bond, because the triple bond could be in a different position. We wouldn't be able to tell from this one. We can tell there is a triple bond. Uh, so what we can do with this one is say, well, it's going to be uh, CN, right? If there were no triple bonds or double bonds or whatever, um, we would have C6H at 12, 14. So we are actually minus two pairs of, of hydrogen, right? So this tells us that there is either two double bond, or there is a triple bond, or there is, for example, a cycle and a double bond. But we can really tell unless we see the structure. So we see the structure and we see that there is a triple bond. How do we represent that um, uh, with the skeletal? Uh, that, that's the correct representation. It almost looks like a capacitator if, if, um, if you're familiar with that type of stuff. But basically you want to, um, you want to convey the information that this is all linear. So this you have carbon one. No, I mean red. Carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4. Okay. Um, so even if, I mean, there is an angle here is 180. So that means that, that in the middle there, there is a carbon. And there is another carbon here. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 carbons. Okay. Uh, in this case, we have two double bonds. Uh, so we can we can draw it like that, and we are trying to convey the information that here you have 100, 120 angles because with the double bond you get a trigonal planar structure. So this is an example of a complicated molecule um, in which you see a little bit of everything, a little bit of a summary of all the um, information, right? So um, if the hydrogen is bonded to a carbon, doesn't matter if it's a single bond, a double bond, if the, the carbon is connected to the hydrogen is forming single or triple bonds, those hydrogen are not written. 
everything that's a functional group is, is written. The wedges are trying to convey the information about the orientation. And so sometimes hydrogen may be included because they give information about the specific uh, order in space in which um, atoms are connected. And each line corresponds to a single bond. Double line corresponds to a double bond. Here you don't have any triple bond. Uh, lone pairs typically are not written. So you see that nitrogen and oxygen are not showing the lone pairs. Um, this is, for example, is a double bond between an oxygen and a carbon. If the hydrogen is bonded to nitrogen and oxygen, then you you would write that. Okay, so that's that's all.